Hello everybody, this is Coach Hart from System Basketball Clinics. Um, I have Coach Keith Mondillo of Gwynedd Mercy joining me this evening to talk, to talk to us a little bit about System Basketball. Hey Coach, can you briefly tell us your history of, of coaching college basketball? I just finished my 25th year at Gwynedd Mercy University. <clears throat> um, I, I mean, there really isn't a lot to tell. 24 years of playing traditional basketball. Um, pressing a little bit, pressure and defense in the half court, working shot clocks, you know, um, shooting the lowest possible point on the shot clock. And then um, uh, the 25th year came <laughs> and um, we decided to change. And again, we, we haven't, we haven't won national championships, so but we've been to um, about nine NCAA tournaments. Um, won seven conference titles, uh, won a, a more than that conference regular season titles. It was the 25th year that I, I felt that we needed to win. That's when we went to the system that 25th year. That's 25 years in a nutshell. <laughs> so, Coach, growing up in Philly, and I'm, I'm a California boy, but I know there's some traditionalists up in Philly about basketball. How did they take it when you were when you said, "I'm going to run the system"? Like, did your boys give you a hard time, or was it? Well, just like uh, anything else, every, everybody. Well, Westhead, well, Westhead's from Philly. Well, you know, Coach at LaSalle, um, he, um, everybody right away goes to that. They think it's Westhead's pressing type, um, defense and stuff like that. But <clears throat> as we know. The system has evolved through um, Coach Dave Arsenal at Grinnell into something totally different. But yeah, growing up in Philadelphia, where we've had, uh, you know, the Philadelphia Catholic League in the city, very traditional basketball 15, 20 passes until um, you get a good shot. The, we used to say the leading scorer in the Philadelphia Catholic League averaged like nine points a game. So, Going to this style, a lot of my friends were in the coaching fraternity and outside the coaching fraternity were had no idea. They basically said, oh, you're Loyola Marymount. You're just running and gunning, right? And I said, well, it's a little bit more than that. And that's when you get into, well, what is the system? And then that could be a five-second conversation to some. It could be a five-hour conversation. Um. Everybody says that they're playing system basketball or you've been on clinics with me on the system. In your eyes, what is the definition of a system basketball team? Well, I think that the purest of the system, the, the Grinnell people and the Olivet people, it's five in, five out, um, every 30 to 45 second shifts. Um, you're, you're really shoot, you're playing system basketball is you're playing with a 12 second shot clock and you're trying to reach your five statistical goals uh, field goal attempts three point attempts um, offensive rebounds force turnovers uh, and then um, plus 25 or so in field goal more than your opponent that's system basketball I know we've talked and we've you and I have had a lot of <clears throat> discussions and a lot of high school coaches say well I can't do that because of limited numbers and Doug always says it Doug goes you, you know you can play fast you could sub every two or three and you you can call it whatever you want but it's not system basketball but I think playing system basketball is 12 second shot clock and you're rotating it's like a hockey shift five in five out every 30 45 seconds Okay, so are your so you you coach for twenty four years, and all of a sudden year twenty five, you say I'm making a switch. Um, why why the switch to system basketball for you, coach? Well, uh, recruiting changed a little bit to the point where I wasn't getting the six one six two post player, and that's what really preempted me to to do this to look into it. 
We had our first losing season since 1995 in the 18-19 academic year. <clears throat> and I just felt that we needed a change. I felt that I needed to do something totally out of the box. I didn't know what. And I just felt that 18-19 season, we had a great group of players. Um, our women worked hard. They were talented. It just never clicked. So I was sitting in my office after a game and uh guy John Logan who does game day event stuff for us. I said to him, What about Grinnell? And he goes, Yeah, that'd be fun. <laughs> so right then and there, him and I started we went on synergy and we watched about I don't know, a game and a half worth of Grinnell. And I said, All right, I'm gonna look into it. And that was probably very early December before the holidays, before Christmas started. And then um no, lo and behold, I'm watching videos, watching all these games on Synergy, calling coaches, and I finally decided that I think this is the right way to do it. And um, at least give it a try. Like, it, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But so, at least... Yeah. So two, three months, you studied it, me been at it for 10 years, and you were in. You were all in. I studied it for two, three months, <laughs> but I used my son's AAU team, his seventh grade AAU team, as a beta test. Okay. So for March, April, May, and a little bit of June, I convinced my AAU parents that this is what we're going to do, play faster, <clears throat> play a little tougher on D, shoot more threes, let them have fun. Mm -hmm. And they were all for it. And, and I kept pretty good notes after tournaments and after practices of almost like a diary of what went well, what went wrong. <clears throat> and I was able to use that come fall when we started practice at Gwendolyn on October 15th. Got it. So when you were doing the studying, what resources or what people did you seek out? For um, you broke, you broke up a little bit, but I think you said what resources that I use. Yeah. Well, first of all, I, watching game film, just getting an idea of how teams play, that was first. I can Google search system playing in Grinnell, and then Coach Arsenal had tapes out. Um, Coach Porter had a ton of tapes out. Um, and... Greenville had tapes out and you just ordered them and just kind of figured out how they did things. And I called some coaches. I called coach Bertini over at Westfield state. And I, um, I beat her here for about an hour and a half <laughs> about why I should do this, why she did, why is she doing it? Um, and I'll tell you what, I, I, for the most part, answer, go back to your other question. We, um, I decided I wanted to do it because I had 15 players on my roster, and we were a below 500 team. And our starting five was a little bit better than our second five. But then our second five and our third five were kind of blurred. And as you know, in traditional basketball, if you're playing more than 10, it ain't going to work. Yeah. So I, one of the things, um, especially – the book that Doug and Coach Smith wrote, participation was a was a big factor. That in this type of system, I was going to be able to play 15 players a night, and now it's not all equal playing time. But now at least I know that my bottom three—I mean, my bottom five, whoever they may be at that given time of the year—they're going to get time in a game significant time not up 30 or down 30 they were going to play in the first quarter um, and uh, that's one of the big reasons why I went to it okay so you put it in year one what was with your players what was the biggest criticism that you had to overcome this season with with they had a hard time with with system basketball hmm. So again, you broke up a little bit. So who was the um? What was the biggest criticism for your from your players about running the system this year? So from my players, 
really, uh, we didn't get much criticism <clears throat> because at our end of season meetings, um, we went and we talked to the players because after that one losing season, I felt that we had no identity. <clears throat> and we pressed a little bit. We went zone. We walked it up. We played pack line. We ran and, and jumped at half court. So, like, we did everything to try and figure out what would work that year. Nothing worked. With my players, I really went off the – even though I was investigating this, I went off of the, um, the premise that if they wanted to run and press more, that those are the answers I, I really needed. Um, they, they wanted to run more. They wanted to play more free. Um, they wanted to get in people's faces defensively. They wanted to be known as an aggressive attacking team. So from that standpoint, the returning players were all for it. <clears throat> um, now obviously, we told our recruits, the five freshmen, that we were going to be faster. But how do you, as you know, Mark, how do you describe the system <laughs> to a recruit without going on ten podcasts to let them know what the heck, <laughs> just what a, what Olivet break is, what. Grinnell break is like, I mean, that in itself is three, four episodes of, of our zoom calls. Exactly. Um, so they bought in at least in the, like, on the surface from the very beginning. Now the criticism came from everybody who didn't know what we were doing, who just thought we're running up and down the floor playing haphazardly. Um, some parents, who understood what we were trying to do, loved it. And some parents were a little, like, I know we had one or two families that were on the fence a little bit, but I think by the end of the year, <clears throat> um, things worked out, but it was, um, it was definitely interesting. I mean, the same old questions, the criticisms are like, you can't win like that. Um, you know, it's not real basketball, everything we've talked about and, and we discussed is it, it's so funny. It, it all, all those predictions in the book came true. Um, every time somebody felt that, you know, we didn't play well that night, it was because of the system. You know, I think it's funny because I don't care what system you play. If you miss 10 foul shots and you lose by three points, I think you can directly correlate your loss to you didn't do shoot well at the foul line. If you turn the ball over 20 times and you lose by six or seven, you can say, well, we turned the ball over 20 times. I don't care what system you play. Um, so those games we didn't play well, it was the system's fault by some people's standards. Now, my president and my administrators, I'm, I'm the athletic director, so the people above me, they loved it. They loved the participation factor. They loved how it was exciting. Um, they saw the energy that it brought to our, our, our players individually and collectively. So... I would like to say halfway through the process, the positives definitely outweigh the negatives. Yeah. So, Coach, what were your system goals? Or what are your system goals? We, um, we wanted to get 90 field goals. I'm writing them down. So I, I, every time I – I'm used to writing them on the dry erase board, 45 of which, half of that we want from three. Okay. We wanted to rebound 40% of our misses. We wanted to create 30 turnovers mm -hmm. or force 30 turnovers. Um, and we wanted to shoot 25 more field goals than our opponent. Those were our system goals for this year. Do you, do you know how many times you may have hit all five of those? I should know that. Um, but we, we probably only, hit all five maybe two or three times okay um whether it was we didn't get um we didn't rebound enough or we, maybe we only created 28 turnovers i mean that happened a lot yeah this is probably a matt peterson our statistical guy question but uh we love you matt um but did you ever take a peek like if you got two of your goals three of your goals four of your goals like if it was three or more, how much? How many games you won? Four or more? Anything? No, I didn't do that. I mean, I should do that. Um, and next year, I, I saw <clears throat> Coach Barber had that big yeah. 
why he got bored in his locker room. I think I might go to that so it's easier to, to, to track. I, I could do it in real time. I don't. That's one thing. I, 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 but it was evident. When we didn't hit, <clears throat> when we hit two out of our five goals, we probably lost almost every time. When we hit three out of our five, we probably were 500 in those games. And then four out of five, we were probably something. Our winning percentage is probably like seven, like seven hundred, something like that. So, how did your stats differ from first year running the system to your twenty? Doesn't necessarily mean your twenty-four things. I mean, you led D three in scoring at the women's level. Was, is that something that you would have thought that you would have been able to do this year, running the system the very first time? Was that even in your wildest dreams? No, I, it really wasn't. I mean, when after the first half of our games, and we, you know, we started looking at stats from the NCA, it started to become wow, we're, like this is really working. Even though in the beginning our wins and losses <clears throat> um, weren't very good, we lost our first two games, 107 points each game. Um, the whole other story, but we did get a lot better. As we started to, as the season started to progress, I noticed in the NCA stats that we were up there in, in about 15 statistical categories. And we were number one in a ton. So to think that we would lead the country in total points scored and points per game, no. I didn't think that was going to happen. Not the first year. Okay. But and then I, I, you wanted to ask, we, just for people out there listening, the last year we were conventional. We scored 1,722 points. The first year in the system, we scored just under 2,500 points. Um, we averaged 66 points a game. The last year we were, we were conventional and 89 points a game when we were on the system. And steals went up. We only had 196 steals. Mm -hmm. uh, our last year of convention and 537 the first year in the system so it's amazing and i think when you did your clinic with us i think it was some wild stat maybe i'm wrong with it that your turnovers were pretty much the same as they were as a conventional team is that correct yeah they were pretty much the same and the, the biggest knock is you shoot all those threes you're never going to get to the foul line well, we shot almost 200 more foul shots than we did the year before. And um, we, did do, we did shoot a lot of threes. Last year in conventional basketball, we, were, we shot 623s. And this first year in the system, we shot 1,371. So let's, let's ask, so how do you, did you do better this season than you thought you would have done as a first year running system? Did you yeah, yeah um, um, definitely, definitely the first year I thought we did better. I mean, the first year run the system, I should say. We our final record was fifteen and thirteen, which on the surface doesn't sound great, but um, some of the teams we played non conference. We're NCAA tournament teams, teams that were ranked in the top 10 um, for Division Three. a bunch of teams that had 20-plus wins a year before. So it was it, – the system really if, – if I had to get some of those first couple games back, those first seven to ten games back, knowing what we know now and how to play it – because, again, we were running for the first year, and we essentially were, you know, we were preparing as much as we could – it almost felt like we were flying by the seat of our pants doing it. But, no, I, I couldn't have been more happy with the results. So so you're doing the studying and everything. How did you determine the offense that you were going to use? When you had jump, if you want a system Zoom clinic, there you've seen six or seven of them now, and uh, you were pretty much doing your studying. How did you determine it that, well, that you were going to go with? Yeah, um, we went with essentially what you and I know is the Olivet break. Um, so I watched a ton of Olivet films on Synergy, and I watched a ton of Grinnell films on Synergy. I watched as many Westfield State games on Synergy. Um, and I kind of 
looked at my personnel and, and, and figured out what was going to be best. And all of that um, was, it just seemed natural for us. And it seemed the easiest to teach for the first year. So it wasn't a complete shock for our, for our players. Um, I'm quite honest with you, it was a gut, a gut feeling that this is what we need to go with. Um, so it wasn't, if you're looking for like a Matt Peterson, like, you know, a board with all the stuff on it, like pluses and minuses, it wasn't like that. It was purely like, I, I think this is what we're going to do. And we just went with it. So how did you, how'd you install it? Did you do the typical install or did you do a little bit differently or how'd you do it? No, we, we did it probably typical as, as um, most teams who run the system do it. The first week was all offense. <clears throat> we just um, talked about, we walked through the break. We wanted to make sure that our players understood <clears throat> um, where to be and how fast they needed to get there. So we, didn't, um, we normally play with a 30-second shot clock in the NCAA. <clears throat> We played with a 12 second clock from day one and the first day it was kind of ugly. <clears throat> Second day it got a little better by the third or fourth day. I had some people sitting on practice um, from the school, not from the outside. And they were wondering how, how many years we were running the system after probably towards the end of the week, how what we were running the break. Cause it really flowed. We got the ball out and, we just set our shot clock at 12 seconds. And if the ball, if the shot went up close to 12 seconds, that was a rarity. We were probably, we were getting the ball past half court. And you saw some of our game tapes, mm -hmm. some clips. We were getting shots up within six to eight seconds. And I got to attribute to our, our women, how hard they worked um, and, and how they embraced running as fast as, as they did the whole year. But that's what we did. For, for seven days, for, or six days of practice, I should say, for one week, we didn't do one defensive drill, not one. So, so I just find basketball is basketball, but everybody says you need to get by it. And you got to do like a PowerPoint and sell it to people above you, your players. You would never think of running the flex offense and having to go to your AD and doing a PowerPoint presentation. Um, I know you did a little Zoom clinic with me. Can you tell the listeners of your your first meeting, what, what you did with your program, and it kind of set the tone to get the buy-in, I believe, because, your player, because you, you already talked about your end-of-season meetings and, and you were already planting the tools in their head to that what you were going to do. But, can you share that with us about the meeting? I think it was great stuff that you, you shared that one night in the oh, clinic. Let me um let me back up first, but I I did share it with my vice president to whom I report to. Okay. It was one of our meetings over the summer, and I sat down and I explained it to him. Um, he was a former soccer player, so I knew he understood sports. And ten minutes into me explaining it to him. And you're a West Coast guy. The first thing he said was, oh, it's basically like Chip Kelly's offense, but for basketball. I like that. I That's said, a good analogy. Yeah. I said it's similar to what Oregon did in football. Um, but constant, it's Oregon football plus ice hockey shifts. And um, so I, I sat down with him and I spoke with him about it. He was all for it. When I told him about the participation, he thought it was great. And then our first team meeting, um, when we got back to school, just to go over logistical stuff for, before practices started in October, I put together a PowerPoint presentation. And I talked about everything they talked about in their end of season meetings. We didn't have an identity. These were their words, not mine. Um, we felt that we didn't play as fast as we should have. Um, we wanted to play fast, so I put everything in a PowerPoint. <clears throat> Then I talked about what the system was, what the system is and what it could be for them. And we just went through each slide and then we watched, I put together um, teams that ran the system. I put together some clips and we watched some film and their faces just dropped, especially when they saw um, 
some of the scores. When I showed him Greenville that year prior, scored 200 <laughs> points in a game. Uh, I'm not suggesting we that was our goal to score 200. I mean, I, I don't know if that can ever be duplicated again. But um, I showed him some of the Olivet scores, some of the Westfield State scores, some of the women that were running it in college. Um, we watched their films, and they were – from at that point on, they were really super into it. They wanted to know what they needed to do before October 15th, <clears throat> the condition. Um, they wanted to know, should we be running cross country type running? Should we do sprints? How often do you want us to lift? <clears throat> and my ultimate statement was, you need to come back here for, on October 15th in the best shape you ever were in your whole athletic career because you have no idea how much we're going to run without running one suicide all year pretty much like my career we never run suicides but last year we never ever had to do a conditioning drill ever so that's how i kind of broke it to him but my first powerpoint presentation to my team ever in 25 years that's my that's what i was saying is you never would have gave him a powerpoint on the triangle so it, it's just, it just blows. It, it, it's been almost, without a doubt, every person's suggestion to make a PowerPoint, right? Like, and I just I, I, it, I, don't even, I don't even know why I thought about that. Like, I don't think Gary or Doug or anybody said put a PowerPoint together, but um, I just felt look, the system is so far out of the box and it's so different that. It's not like, hey, we're just going to go to this really fun zone. It's not the buzz zone. You know the buzz defense and zone? Yeah, yeah Mike DeVibolis. Yeah, it's not the buzz. It's definitely not pack line. <laughs> you know, if you brought in um, uh, any of the Virginia coaching staff, if you brought in Tony Bennett, he might have a heart attack watching – one of our practices. He probably, you know, he probably blesses himself every time he hears the word Greenville or Grinnell. <laughs> um, practices, are you are you typical? Are you an hour, 30 minutes, hour, 15 minutes? I mean, or did it depend on the day? Um, definitely in the beginning of the year. The first month we went two hours because we were explaining a lot of stuff. It wasn't too much running like when – we did have some downtime trying to explain things, whether that was, you know, looking at stuff on the board or watching film. But as the season progressed, our practices were, they went from like an hour and 45, to the holidays, an hour and a half. We got back from after the holidays. It was like an hour and 15. And then by the middle of January, we were going to the, like the third week, we were going an hour, literally one hour. By February, 45 minutes. And then, you know, depending on our, on that calendar that week, we might on um, on Monday just go over all break, transition stuff, all break stuff. Tuesday we might go over um, our trapping against our Wednesday opponent. How they line up, how we're going to combat their press break. Thursday, we might lift because it's a day after a game, give their legs rest. Friday, we might go over like um, half court defense. Saturday, we play. Um, now, we can adjust that. and But we did take the tack where, where, you know, Doug Porter talked about going over one thing on one day. And I felt the first year that was important because they weren't confused about four. I know. Um, Westfield State does it different. Coach Bertini yeah, she does. does a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. And I think I'll eventually get to that. Um, but I think the first year I had to go one thing at a time just so we have an idea. Our players had a better idea of what they needed to do in those situations. So we have high school, co high school coaches, girls coaches, girls college coaches, boys college coaches. Why do you think it works so well on the girls' side? And what seem to be running it? And me doing the Zoom clinics, with the data I'm doing, it seems like there's more girls 
on the girl's side interested in it than the guy's side. Why do you feel that it works so much better on the girl's side? Well, let me give you an example. <clears throat> when we first started talking about running this and we decided to do this, I have one of my players is like a six foot, really athletic um, kid who came out of high school, was all league in her high school in softball. So she could throw. So I put her at the baseline, Mark. And I said to her, I want you to throw this beyond half court. Out of 15 players on my team, she was the only one that could get it beyond half court and throw it somewhat accurately. Mm -hmm. So to your point, why does this work better with, with women? I feel if you put all five defensive players in the, in the back court, like pressing the ball, up on the ball, um, I think it, it, it just puts so much pressure on these guys. And like I think Coach Arsenal said, Women aren't dunking on the break. On two on one breaks, it's got to be a layup. And you might give up a layup. They might miss a layup. You have, you have players running behind. Um, I just think it's beneficial to run this for women for the simple reason of women can't throw that long cross court pass like men can. And let's call it what it is. Most, most of the, of, of, um, women's high school teams might only have one ball handler on the floor. Yeah. Maybe one. In college, there's probably four that can handle the ball, but high school girls, there's probably one. The really good teams in the state that win state championships, yeah, they'll have four ball handlers on the floor at once. But I would say 90% of the high school girls programs have one primary ball handler, and if you put the ball in someone else's hand and, and trap off the point guard, I think you can just create turnover after turnover. Um, and, the, and why I think this works, I think if you, if you run your, your, um, your groups in and out effectively, I think, I think players, kids in high school will, will work even harder. Um, is there anything that you would have done differently this year, like with your install, now that you've learned a little bit more, that you could have maybe got the points across to your players easier or made life easier now that you've grown? Yeah, I, I think the, the actual transition, the actual install, I would keep the same. I wouldn't worry about putting in ref handle plays as much as I thought I, I did in the beginning. I felt that I introduced that a little too early. And, I, you know, you saw my Zoom call. I, I like on dead balls when the referee handles it, I like to create some action Correct. in the full court and when it's inbounded in the half court or the side out with the ultimate goal, still playing with the 12-second shot clock, trying to generate more possessions. So I think I would be more focused on um, the fundamentals of the break and do an individual. Like, again, I don't care what, what basketball system you run. To work with your players individually um, and practice with different skill work. Now, we did our 100 shots, uh, 100 attempts per, per practice, but I think like your breakdown sessions, individual skill work in the beginning, when you're just doing transition stuff, we could have done a little bit more. Uh, Are you, yeah. Are that you going to do anything differently heading into year two? You think? Yeah. I mean, um, you put a little plug in for your Zoom calls and stuff, but <laughs> I got a notebook here. Every Zoom call that I've been a part of, which I think I've been on about 90%. Yes, yeah. I yeah. something <laughs> down. Um, the one fun thing I'm going to do is, I think Coach Arsenal said it, each time there's an action in a game, that's a plus for your team, whether it's a three, a steal, a deflection, a rebound. The bench has to have a specific celebration for that. Huh. I mean, I know that that's kind of like row your boat or something. What's that? <laughs> like, like the bench mob, row the boat. <laughs> something. Just and have a contest and just to see which one wins out. I think that. I think. The fun on the floor did translate to the bench, but I want to make sure that the bench has just as much fun this year 
And I say the bench, the people that are not in the game for like a minute or two. Um, and then the one thing Coach Porter always talked about, and I tried to instill this, but I'm going to do a better job this year, is playing without fear. Like literally just whether you want to run through a ball on defense, um, you want to pull up for that three in transition, playing without fear from the very beginning. Because now I think our upperclassmen, our 10 or 11 players coming back, really have a good understanding of what we're doing. And we have to teach the freshmen coming in, um, you know, what we're doing. That fear factor of, well, should I shoot this shot? Because there's really 24 seconds on the clock. Last year, you wanted me to shoot that at five seconds. Now it's just pure, you're just playing as hard as you can. So I think if I, if I wanted to change something, that's what I would change. Well, now I'm going to rattle off probably the questions that every system newbie or person looking into it wants to know or has I questions is, so your shifts, Coach, how long? How long did you have them out there before you sent them to the table? Honestly? 30 seconds. Okay. I, I, I had my one assistant coach had this chart and he was in charge of we need to make adjustments for whatever reason, moving kids around and shifts. We never double shifted anybody for the most part, unless it got to the end of the game and we uh, went to our finishing group. But for the most part, if the ball went up with 10 minutes left in the first quarter, at the 10.30 mark, excuse me, at the 9.30 mark, there were five people already at the table. So that shift was over at 31 seconds, 35, 45, we got somebody in and then boom. We had a new five at the table, 30 seconds. And in the beginning, I, you, know, you had to call your players out and say, who's coming off the floor right now not winded? And if you had two or three, raise your hand. Your question would be, why? Tell me why. Why are you doing everything in your power to take away a lag pass, to run the floor, to crash the boards and get a rebound? Because, you know, it's to, you know, as we talked about, Mark, sending four to the glass, having your shooter rotate back as a safety initially, you talk about something totally out of the box. That's totally out of the box. Yeah. So did you create three groups of five, two groups? How did, how did, you, how did you build your shifts? What we did is because of – we had um, – an injury and we had a player leave school so we played most of the season with 14 so for the most part we played with two um, groups of seven God. substituted within those seven which was enabled us to get a lot of our players um, more minutes a lot of our better players more minutes and those throughout the year because of our plus minus that we have lucky enough our stat program we move those groups around every so often just to create a different dynamic um, but for the most part we subbed with the two groups of seven and when we had 15 for a good part of the year you know obviously one had eight one had seven um, I'd like to get to that point where I could put out three groups of five that are effective I'm hoping to do that this year um, time will tell okay um, roster size. So high schools can't always carry 18 guy, 18 girls or guys. What would you say would be an ideal or, or minimum roster size for a high school level with 30 quarters? The game's 20% shorter than your game. So what would you advise? Well, I think all high schools have a tendency of, of grouping a lot of games together. Yes. Like, like I could see a high school. Like I always see high school teams playing three games in five days. We play. What's that? We play six. We play sixteen games or something like that between November and Christmas. Like they they jam pack like middle of November to Christmas break. We'll play three. We'll play tw uh, eighteen basketball games and then. We get yeah, that's, yeah. So, so, I think minimum for high school, minimum is twelve. Okay. I just I can't. I, the games are shorter. 
you can go with two groups of six and stuff within those groups and keep your better players on the floor. Ideally, maybe high school probably would be 14. I think, or I think college minimum is 15 for a whole season. Obviously, if you know, we have an ankle injury here, a sickness here, you might have to play with 14 once or twice. I would love to get my ideal roster size would be 18 for college. I think anything over 18, it's tough to, to retain players. Um, so high school, minimum 12, I'd probably ideal be 14. It's great, though, for practices because you can practice with your JV. Mm-hmm. You, know, you can have 20-some players in a high school practice with 12 being from varsity and 12 being from JV. That would be a great practice for assistant yep. basketball. It's what I – I'm going to do it one or two ways. I'm going to either have varsity and JV together or carry around 13, 14 on roster. And then my five best lower level players to varsity practices and have a control team and then your your top 10 so that you yeah. can play system. Because I, ch- I, I mentioned this on Barber's uh, Zoomcast the other day, is system create participation but I think one of the biggest obstacles will be is if you carry 16 and you don't play all 16 you'll still have those issues that you would have on a traditional team so it's probably only better to have like 13 or 14 and play everybody and then take those other five and say hey go play in the JV game so that they get minutes because there's no winning whether you play system or you play traditional. You're either playing too many people or you're playing yeah. not enough. So um, what would you advise to a coach that doesn't really have any idea? How would they go about? What would what would you have them do? I mean, I know you did it. You did it. I mean, you're, you're an experienced coach, so you knew where to kind of go. And most people know how to search on the Internet. And you mentioned some of those things. What? If they're very interested in doing this, what would you advise them to do? I would tell them to jump on your Zoom calls, put it to you that way. And and, (laughs) and maybe, uh, you know, ask for some of it, purchase some of your your material. But I I think talking to other coaches that do this is, I think, is your first step. Before you watch any film, I think you need to talk to coaches why they do this. Um, how they do it. Again, you said it. All, all, all system teams do it differently. From high school to college, from women to men, from girls to boys. Um, and see what, what's successful at in your niche, at your level. And then go about looking at... Because again, you and I talked about this on the phone. Um, what Coach Smith did, what Grinnell does, what Greenville does, what Olivet does, it's all different. They're all system teams. They all do it differently. And you got to sift through that to see what's best for your team, which might be um, what is simpler to teach. And I know that might be, to some, that might be a cop-out, but I don't mm-hmm. think it is. Because um, I went with what was the simplest to teach them. What, how fast can I get my players up to speed? Because um, we all know there's going to be that learning curve. We all know in the first month or two, you're you're going to be treading water, and that is an understatement. Um, so I think the first thing would reach out to people like yourself, um, to to me if they want Coach Barber, um, you know, Coach Dave, Young Dave. I mean, and, and, and Coach. Okay, Brief Coach Bertine, point to them. Explain to them that you're right. You've been on 90% of them, you're, and you've spoken at one. You were the featured speaker at one. And whether it's our Friday night social where it's more laid back, me and you are have been like, and we write down a nugget here or there. And I've learned so much from you. Being I've talked to you so much because you just did it. So... And the, I think what's great about them is you got a bunch of group of guys of like-minded people that are doing it. Like, it's probably one percent of the coaches out there that run this. So, if that if that percentage. So, um, 
When did when was the aha moment this year? You think for your team that where they went ah we got this or 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 we can do this? They believed in it. How long did it take? Well, I think there was a few. Okay. In one of our first scrimmages, we put up 145 points in one of our first scrimmages. Wow. Now it was it was a division three team that um, was athletic, but they they were. St- they had a new coach, and they were trying to feel their way through things. <clears throat> that was the first, like, this can work. Then we played an average Division two team, and we basically played them even. That's when they knew it could work. And then, boom, we jumped in. We played a team that was, you know, um, won 24 games a year before. Another team that was in the NCAA tournament. Um, a team that was in the Final Four in our tip-off tournament the year before. Once we started playing really good teams and we had a little bit of success throughout the game, you know, we were down to, um, I might have the exact numbers wrong. We were down to the University of Scranton by 20. They were in the final four. And um, next thing you know, two minutes later, three minutes later, I think we're down five with the ball with three minutes left. So there was a bunch of aha moments. I don't think it was until right before Christmas. We played two games right before Christmas, and everything started to click. And that's where our players knew we were on the right track. So it took all of October in practice, November's games, and at the end of December, right before the holidays, it took almost three months before our players realized this is the right way to go. Okay. Um was it more difficult for you to install the offense or the defense? The defense. At least, I mean, some some people might have the opposite, but the defense is because it's so unpredictable and you want it to be unpredictable. Um, a lot of my players over my years always wanted absolutes. When the ball's here, we're going to trap here, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. <clears throat> And in system basketball, it just doesn't work. You know, our closest two people trap, um, whether it's a missed shot trap or not, um, who runs back, who does what, that was the hardest thing to teach. We watched more film, broke down more film and, and stuff on the whiteboard than I did in my 24 years prior. Did you? Uh, the defense was definitely the hardest. Did you stick, did you only install a couple or did you do all four of them that are talked about? What did you do? For the most part, we were just in our state press. Oh, excuse me. We were in our arm press. Okay. Um, we used off when teams on dead balls, when teams would go four across or do something a little bit out of whack. <clears throat> but just like we talked about in our calls, we tried stay, but I felt when we were in stay, our players became less aggressive. Okay. So to answer your question about four ago, if I change something different, I would probably stay with our on press longer than anything and just make adjustments out of that, as opposed to trying to put a couple of pr- other presses in. So if you're coaching mm-hmm. high school girls or boys, would you just stick with on press for the first season or would you throw in like two of them? No, I, I think it depends on the learning curve of your team. I think if, if, the, your own press is going to be gre- your most aggressive press, and you know that. Yep. Um, I think you need to show off when teams do something creative um, on dead balls. Um, I like with what um, Olivet does in the half court on a dead ball, how they tra- quickly trap out of that. Um, I have notes on that from the from your one Zoom call. From that trying- What's that? From Coach Glenn. Yeah, um, she really articulated it like it's just a simple little. Um, it's almost like your state press in the half court. Okay. Um, so for high school coaches, though, I would stay with um, the on press for more than than anything else because it just creates more possessions. Going into year two, coach, and now you didn't really recruit to run system because you kind of decided later to do it after you brought in your first recruiting class last year. So where do you think uh, Gwen and Mercy will be heading in the year two? Do you think you'll see a 
Well, we do have right now have four really good athletic freshmen coming in. Um, we probably have about one more that we're looking at. Um, I know we want to bring in as many kids as possible um, to run system, but I don't want to re re over recruit too many. I, I think recruiting is going to be a little easier, Mark. I think we're going to be able to identify. Coach Bertini said it perfectly. He goes, I can't get the 6-1 back to the basket post player, but I can get a whole bunch of 5-6 athletic guards. And our goal is to get 5-6, five, 5-8 six, five, guards that are interchangeable. Um, and if our fours we pick up are 5-11, five, 5-10, five, if I can run a little bit and shoot from the perimeter, which we have, I have a six-foot guard forward coming in who can shoot from the perimeter and she's athletic. Um, I think you recruit to a niche. And I think that helps a little bit as opposed to trying to find that diamond in the rough or needle in the haystack from the back of the basket type player. Um, if we can have five players on the floor that are interchangeable, that would be my ultimate goal. Okay. Says my speaker's having some problems. Can you hear me? Um, yeah, I can hear you. You're okay. breaking up a little bit. <clears throat> okay. So, you go. so um, as we're wrapping up here, do you have any last advice for our system coaches or last parting words for them? I think if you, you want to do something out of the box and you want to have fun, again, I, I, I was the head coach for 24 years. I was an assistant for two. Um, we've won NCAA tournament games. We've won championships in dramatic fashion. But the most fun I've ever had was coaching this team this year as a coach. This team was the, by far um, one of the hardest working teams I ever had. We were 15 and 13. We finished third in our league. Now, we had two teams ahead of us that were very good but for the most part if, if you're going to do this and I think I told you this Mark it, it can't be the hokey pokey you can't have one foot in and one foot out Yeah, you, you have to dive into the deep end and tread water as long as you can until you can get to the shallow end and things start, start working out for you that's my advice well now we have a little now since this all got created, there's more of a support group for all of us. Um, I want to thank Coach Mondello for coming, um, him coming to the system, Zoom clinics. If you want to see him, he's, we usually have it Wednesday, Friday, Saturdays, Wednesday night and Saturday nights, usually a topic. Friday night, we watch a game, break it down. You can get more information at Thank you. And we're going to see you at future Zooms this summer. And best of luck to you and the women next year at Gwynedd Mercy. Mark, before we get off, though, I do want to say things happen for a reason. And this pandemic came upon us in early March. And you guys start putting, you, you and Bob start putting this together and you took the reins and you really ran with it. The clinics have helped me out in a way that is so much better than watching game film. Um, you're able to interact and talk to all coaches. We broke down game film. Um, like I said, I got one or two nuggets from every coach from high school, college. Um, so you're the reason why a lot of these coaches, it, it, it might be like the, the virus. It might spread. Like you might be the, the host who's spreading the system all amongst 50 states in this United States. And I, that's a good thing. So I appreciate everything you've done for it. I appreciate it, Coach, and thanks again for your time, and we'll probably see you sometime this week. So This week. I thank you. Take care, Bob. All right, man. Thank you.